today, as we get into this, this is going to be a continuation of last week's story. Now, uh, one thing I want to say, if how many of you would describe your family background as being somewhat dysfunctional? Okay, good, most of us. I mean, if you don't come from a family that's dysfunctional, how do you even exist in today's world? But, but I want you to know that, that today is going to be good for you because no matter how crazy your family was, this family's gonna be crazier. So it's gonna give you a good feeling there. Um, each week, the big challenge is what do you leave in and what do you leave out because there is so much. I wanna give you enough that you get the picture, but hopefully that, that you'll take it to the next level and track, track down some things and, and see what the Lord might have to say to you. So again, what to leave in and what to leave out is always the big challenge. There on your outline, you wanna write down that our story is gonna take place over seven years. So this is gonna be about seven years we're gonna cover today, a little bit from last week, but it's seven years. Jacob is going to be uh, starting about 83 years old and is gonna go through about 90 years old. So you wanna write that down. Now, some might go a year later, some might go a year earlier, but it's right in that, that time period in his life. If uh, you've been with us, this will be by, by way of reminder, if you're new to the story today, here, here's what, what's happened so far in the story. Um, it was about seven years or so earlier in, in the story that Jacob, who we're gonna be talking about today, goes and deceives his father Isaac and his brother Esau. And uh, he deceives the, his father and Esau and his father Isaac and his brother Esau into giving him the blessing. And, uh, and so we talked about that when we were there. Esau, his brother, is so angry that he wants to kill Jacob. So Jacob is going to run for his life. And so he's going to leave where he was in southern Israel. He's going to go about 500 miles to the north to the area of Haran, where his uncle Laban lives. And so he goes up there. Now, when he gets there, he finds that his uncle Laban has two daughters. One is called Rachel and one is called Leah. Now, there's debate as we get into some of the names today whether or not these will be the names that uh, Laban, the father, calls them or these are the names that Jacob will call them because uh, their names are gonna be mentioned in the Hebrew, which Jacob speaks, but Laban doesn't speak that as his primary language. So there's some debate and you just might wanna, wanna know that. So he has these two daughters. Jacob falls in love with Rachel. And so he tells Laban, he says, I will work seven years for your daughter, Rachel. And so seven, uh, he, he does that, works for seven years. And then on the wedding night, as you follow this story, Uncle Laban switches the daughters. And so Jacob goes into the tent and he wakes up the next morning and we find out that, that uh, he has married Leah, not the one that he was in love with. Have I totally confused you or are you tracking with me? Okay, all right. So Jacob wakes up and he realizes that he's married Leah. So last week we looked at the descriptions there in your outline from Genesis 29. It says, now Laban had two daughters. The name of the older was Leah, and the name of the younger was Rachel. And Leah's eyes were weak. Then the next word is but, or on the other hand, uh, Rachel, on the other hand, was beautiful of form and face. Now, Jacob loved Rachel. So you have this contrast between the two sisters. Um, Rachel was beautiful, and, and, uh, but Leah, on the other hand, was weak, or her eyes were weak as, as it translates into English. Now, some suggest, and there in your outline, I put the, the, the definition for Leah from the International Standard Bible Encyclopedia, and Leah can be translated into English as weary, tired, or cow. Doesn't mean she's a weary, tired cow, that's not the idea. It's just that those are the ways that you can translate that. Now. When it says her eyes were weak, some suggest that what this is indicating is that she was hard on the eyes. Like to look at her, she was just, you know, you, you didn't want to. But so, so they would say some commentators hold that she's just plain ugly. I don't want to go that far. Um, we're just going to say maybe she's a little bit on the homely side. Now, 
If your name is Leah today, from last week, we highlighted that that's not what the name means in, in today's, today's English. You know, it's more beautiful and delicate and meadow and things like that. So, but the point that's being made here, and you wanna write this down, this is very deep, write this down, that Rachel was hot, but Leah was not. <laughs> so you wanna write that down. Now, from only the deepest stuff here today, folks. Now, from last week, uh, we, we talked about how Jacob never loved Leah. And, uh, you know, he didn't work for her. He didn't pursue her. You know, he, he didn't love her. But he wakes up and he finds that he's married to Leah, not Rachel. And, of course, Laban says we marry off the older before the younger. So if you want the younger one, the good-looking one, then you have to work another seven years. Jacob is a little bit wiser. So this time he gets the girl up front before the seven years so he's not deceived again. So we talked about that last week, and he works another seven years. We're in that seven-year time period that he has Rachel, but he's kind of working off the, the payment. Last week, as we ended the story, Leah, the wife that he didn't want to marry, she has four sons. And so she, she's giving birth, but so far, Rachel hasn't had any. So we're going to come to chapter 30 today as we pick this up. And um, as we, we, we do this, um, I want you to write down one of the things that we're going to find about Rachel is that she's pretty, but she's grumpy. And you want to write that down. She's going to be grumpy. So verses 1 and 2. It says, now, when Rachel saw that she bore Jacob no children, she became jealous, however your Bible says it, you want to highlight that, of her sister, and she said to Jacob, give me children or else I die. Then Jacob's anger burned against Rachel, and he said, am I in the place of God who has withheld from you the fruit of the womb? So, so here you have Rachel, and from last week, you'll remember her name it means you, which is a, you know, a, a, a female sheep. It's, it's warm, it's cuddly, and, and, and all that. But apparently there's this ongoing argument, and, and she's angry that she's not having children. There's a rivalry between Rachel and her sister Leah, and that's going to become more prominent as we go. So she's pretty, and Jacob wanted to marry her, but Jacob's going to learn a very valuable lesson. And the lesson is this there on your outline, that it's better to live alone in the desert than with a crabby complaining wife. <laughs> no comment, please? No. <laughs> so, so how grumpy is she? Well, interesting. Uh, you'll recall that last week as we went through the story of Jacob and Leah, it said that he hated her, and that word was very strong. Uh, some would say unloved, but, but other translations said he, he just hated her. But Rachel is so grumpy, and we'll see this throughout her life, that at the end of Jacob's life, one of the things that he says, and we'll see this when we get there in Genesis 49, Jacob says there in the outline, you must bury me where I buried Leah. So the idea is bury me with the homely one, not with the good looking one. She, Rachel was just so good look, um, so grumpy that you know, I don't even wanna be buried near her. So we're gonna, we're gonna notice some things as we get into this. So Rachel's grumpy. And, but we notice some things about Rachel which are gonna be uh, very important. We'll just see this throughout the story. First of all, we're going to notice that Rachel never seeks the Lord. She never seeks the Lord. In verse one, it just says, when, then Rachel saw, when Rachel saw that she bore Jacob no children, she became jealous of her sister, and she said to Jacob, give me children or else I die. No, no matter where we find Rachel in the story, there will never be any joy, there will never be any thanksgiving, there will never be any seeking the Lord. And, and so you, you just wanna know that. Um, so she, she never seeks the Lord in, in, in any of the story. Another thing that we're going to find is that Rachel will trust in the wrong God. She's not even a believer in what we would say the God of the Bible. So Jacob will be a believer, in the, we would say the God of the Bible, but, but Rachel really isn't. Now, since she's not, she's gonna be worshiping an idol. Everybody worships something. What we're going to find is that in a few years, as the story goes, when it's time for Jacob to leave and, and move back to where his family came from, Rachel is going to steal the family's idols, the family's gods. There in your outline, it says Rachel was the one who had stolen the idols. So, so she's gonna steal the, the family idols because that's what she really trusts in. And uh, we might mention that as we go. Now, 
she doesn't seek the Lord. She doesn't believe in the, the God of the Bible. But another thing that we notice about her is that Rachel blames others for her problems. She blames others for her problems. In verse one, once again, it says, now when Rachel saw that she bore Jacob no children, she became jealous of her sister and she said to Jacob, give me children or else I die. Uh, the idea is she's blaming Jacob for not giving her children. She's saying it's all your fault. Now, as, as you know the story, Jacob has had four sons with her sister. So, so the, the problem's not on Jacob's end, uh, but something's happening with Rachel where she's not getting pregnant. And so Rachel's the kind of person that no matter what, it's never her fault. It's always somebody else's fault. Anybody know anybody like that? It's never their fault. So, so that's kind of the thing. In her mind, she's not the problem. So Rachel doesn't seek the Lord. She becomes confused in her thinking and then ultimately what we're going to find, and you wanna write this down, is that Rachel finds the wrong answer in her culture, in her culture. So verse three, it's going to tell us, she said, here is my maid Bilha. you wanna underline Bilha. go into her that she may bear on my knees that through her I too may have children. So, so Rachel doesn't seek the Lord, so she goes to her culture to find the answer. And when you see this, she says, go into my maid. It looks a whole lot like what was the common idea in that time period. How many of you have ever heard of the Code of Hammurabi? Have you ever heard of that, Code of Hammurabi? So, um, and, and I put a website there that you can look up later on today. And there was this code, which is in that area of the, we'd say the Near East, Middle East. And, and what happened was the code was written kind of as a reflection of what was going on in the culture. Then it was written, and then it became codified, and it came, became just like, this is just what you do. This is what you do. And so if you look that up today, you want to find uh, verses 144, 145, and 146, where it talks about this where you just give your, your, your wife or your, your wife, if you're not getting pregnant, she brings to you a, a secondary wife and you try to have kids through, through her. Now keep in mind that God and the Bible is not condoning any of this. It's just reporting what they're doing and that'll be important for our, our study. So again, in their culture, from the Code of Hammurabi and just there in, in, in the Middle East apparently, is the goal was to have sons. And so if a wife wasn't having sons, then she would take another woman who would become a secondary wife to the husband, and then through her, uh, he would have sons, but those sons would be considered to actually belong to the first wife. Now, in our culture, we're kind of shocked that they would, that they would do that, that that was just kind of one of those culturally accepted things. But before we're overly shocked by them and their culture, just know that our culture is as crazy and maybe even more crazy than their culture. You see, in their culture, the goal was to have children, the goal to have sons. But in our culture, if a woman gets pregnant, a, a, a mommy gets pregnant and she decides that she doesn't wanna have the son or the child, it's just culturally accepted that you just terminate the pregnancy and you end the life of the child and that's considered okay in our culture. Well, in that culture, interesting, in, in our culture, whether you're in elementary school or junior high or high school and apparently going to kindergarten now, that we're just told you just have sex with whoever you want, whoever you want and that becomes culturally acceptable. Now, um, interesting thing about their culture, they would only have a physical relationship with somebody that they were actually married to, even though that marriage might look very different than, than how we would perceive marriage. But in their minds, it would only be with somebody that they're married with. So their culture, uh, we might look at and say is crazy, but our, our our culture is just as crazy and maybe even crazier just in, in different ways, which is why as believers, we are to go to the Lord to find out what we're to do, not to our culture. Does that make sense? 
So we want to talk about that because here, Jacob is going to be a believer, but what he is doing is he is allowing so much of the local culture to infiltrate his family. And although God is going to use this family, we're going to find that this family is going to become a train wreck as we go. So I would suggest that their culture and our culture is driven by a spirit, but the spirit that drives it is not the Holy Spirit. And so we're we're gonna see how that that all pans out for them. So again, God's going to use Jacob's family, but, but his family is going to be a train wreck. Now when Jacob comes to the end of his life and he looks back over all the years and the parenting and the family and how he did life and how he did just just family and, and, and all of that, Jacob is going to say there in your outline, Jacob said, all the years of my life have been few and painful, painful. When he looks back over his life, he's allowed so much of the current culture to infiltrate his family that he says it was just painful, it's just painful. And we'll talk about that as we go. So far, so good? So not seeking the Lord and then looking to her culture to find answers, we have verse four. So she gave him her maid Bilhah as a wife and Jacob went into her. Now this is interesting, Uh, names are always important in the Bible. Uh, Bilhah just means confused, does everybody see that? means confused. So he's married Leah. She's homely. Some suggest just plain ugly. Uh, He's married Rachel, but she's grumpy. So Jacob marries Bilhah, but she's just confused. And so you want to write that down. See how that goes. Well, verse five, it says, so Bilhah conceived and bore Jacob a son. Then Rachel said, God has vindicated me, however your Bible says it, and has indeed heard my voice and has given me a son. Therefore, she named him Dan. She names him Dan. Now, Dan just means, in in the Hebrew, it it just means uh, judgment. We'll put that there on your outline. And she thinks that God has vindicated her because she has given this other woman to her husband, the other woman has become pregnant and she sees that as God's vindication. We'll talk about that. I wanna suggest that Rachel can only give confusion, Bilhah, because Rachel herself is confused. Her wisdom is not coming from the Lord, her wisdom is coming from the culture. One of the interesting things that we'll find as we travel through this, we're going to find that as you have these 12 sons that are born, none of them will contain the name of God in their name. So when we say Dan here, um, that just means judgment. Now my middle name is Daniel, Daniel, I go by Dan. But Daniel, which you have Dan and then you have the L, which means God. So it will become very common hundreds of years after the first 12 are, are born, to attach the name of God somehow to the family, to the, to the names of the children. So Danielle will be God is my judge or judges with the judgment of God. And so as you go through the Bible, you find all of these names like, like uh, Joshua or Yehoshua, which is Jehovah is the savior, Jehovah saves. But here in these names, what we're going to find is God, the name of God is not attached to any of these names. And we'll talk about that as we go. So it doesn't get better, it doesn't get better. So verse seven, it says, Rachel's maid conceived again and bore Jacob a second son. And, and Rachel said, with the mighty wrestlings, I have wrestled with my sister. There's this rivalry like Jacob and Esau. I've wrestled with my sister and I have indeed prevailed. And she named him Naphtali, Naphtali. Naphtali there in your outline just means my wrestling, my wrestling. So Rachel hasn't had any kids at this point, but her maid, Bilhah, now has two children with Jacob. Now I love this from the Living Translation. It says, Jacob named him Naphtali, for she said, I have had an intense struggle with my sister and I am winning. Well, she's given confusion, Bilhah, because she is confused. 
Her sister has had four children. Rachel so far has had no children. Her maid is given, this will further divide the affections of the family, but Rachel thinks that she is winning. That's confusion. Would you agree with that? That's just confusion. She's just confused. Rachel doesn't seek the Lord. She looks to her culture to make decisions. So she's operating out of her culture. And in verse one, we underline the word jealousy. So she's operating out of jealousy. She's making decisions that are going to affect the family very negatively as as it goes. So the question is, does it get worse or does it get better? Well, it's actually going to get, get, get worse. So, so far, Jacob has married um, Leah, we might say homely, some would say just plain ugly, um, Rachel, which is, who's grumpy, and, and then Bilhah, who's just confused. But here's where the competition heats up. Verse nine, it says, when Leah saw that she had stopped bearing, she took her, name, her maid Zilpah, underlines Zilpah, and gave her to Jacob as a wife. Zilpah, it turns out, from Easton's Bible Dictionary, just means drooping. I'm not going to touch that one. We're not going to do any fill in the blanks. I'm not even going to talk about it. I just put that out. That's what it says. But so far, he's married homely, grumpy, confused, and drooping. So that, that's where he's at. Let's go to verse 10, shall we? Verse 10. Now, Leah's maid, Zilpah, bore Jacob a son. And Leah said, how fortunate. My Bible says, how fortunate. So she named him Gad. Now, this is interesting because Gad, there on your outline, means Lord of fortune. Then it tells us the specific Lord. Or troop of Baal, or Baal for some of you. Uh, so, so Lord of fortune or troop of Baal. So your Bibles will translate this two different ways. It will say, Leah said, how fortunate. So she named him Gad. And then other translations will say, Leah said, a troop cometh, because you can translate it that way. And she called him, his name, Gad. Although uh, the God of the Bible is not mentioned in any of their names, one of the things that we notice is that the God Baal, Baal, is actually hinted at in in at least one of the names. This just tells you the spiritual temperature of the family at this point. So far, so good? So uh, God, keep in mind, God is going to use this family, but there's gonna be some great regret as they go. Verse 12, Leah's maid, Zilpah, bore Jacob a second son. Then Leah said, happy, underline, happy am I, for women will call me happy, underline. So she named him Asher. Asher. So Asher just means happy, happy. So she thinks now she's going to be happy because her maid has, has now given a son to, to Jacob. Well, verse four, again, that reflects the culture. Verse 14. Now in the days of the wheat harvest, Reuben, now Reuben was the firstborn of Leah. Reuben is probably four or five years old at this point. And so that's, that's about the, the age that he is. Uh, Reuben went out and found, my Bible says, mandrakes in the field and brought them to his mother, Leah. Then Rachel said to Leah, please give me some of your son's mandrakes. But she, Leah, said to her, it is a small matter for you to take my husband uh, and now you would take my son's mandrakes. I've underlined, is it a small matter for you to take my husband? And would you now take my son's mandrakes also? So Rachel said, therefore, he may lie with you tonight in return for your son's mandrakes. So a couple of things here. Uh, first of all, you'll remember that, that Leah was part of the deception. When she switched at the honeymoon and she comes into the tent, uh, she never says a word. She just allows herself to, to go through with that, never brings it up. So she was part of the deception. Jacob never loved Leah. He never worked for her. He never pursued her. But he wakes up the next morning and he finds that, that, that he's married to her. But here, Leah blames Rachel for her husband's affection. She says, the reason, the problem is that you've, you've taken away my husband from me, not realizing that he never wanted to be married to her. So then you have these mandrakes. How many of your Bibles say mandrakes? 
Something like that, okay. Now, when it says mandrakes, depending on the commentary you read, nobody really has any idea what these things are. There are fruit, that's all we know. That's the only thing we can really be uh, sure of. Some suggest that these might be associated with some type of aphrodisiac or fertility, we, we don't really know. But apparently, Leah takes the deal, she gives the mandrakes to Rachel, and so then she, she has, uh, well, we'll pick it up in verse 16. When Jacob came home from the field in the evening, then Leah went out to meet him and said, you must come in to me, for I have surely hired you with my son's mandrakes. So he lay with her that night. And God gave heed to Leah, and she conceived and bore Jacob a fifth son. And Leah said, and this is very important, God has given me my wages because, and you want to underline that word, because, because I gave my maid to my husband, so she named him Issachar, Issachar. Um, Very quickly, just know that the the mandrakes were not used in getting Leah pregnant. It it was Leah's son that had the mandrakes, whatever they are, she gives those to Rachel. Rachel has the mandrakes. So then Leah gets Jacob for the night. So that they had nothing to do with it. They're not even uh, with Leah. But she names this child Issachar. In the Hebrew, it would be Yishachar, uh, which means God has given me my wages. It comes from the root word there, sakar, which means payment of contract, concretely salary, fare, maintenance by implication, compensation, benefit. She believes that God has paid her by giving her a child. And here's why she thinks God has paid her by giving her a child, verse 18. Verse 18, it says, God has given me my wages. This is my payment because, because, because. I gave my maid to my husband, so she named him Issachar. Here's what what this means. She's saying, in essence, I didn't want to give my maid to my husband as a wife, but I did. I denied myself because I felt that it was the right thing to do, and now God has blessed me for giving my maid to my husband. Ladies, Do you think that God rewards you by giving to your husband another woman? You sound like you don't know. The answer is no. The the answer is no. You'll never get it wrong here, I promise. The answer is no. But here's what she's doing. She's connecting the dots, but she's connecting the wrong dots. She thinks, here's why God did this, because my culture says to do this. As, As humans, we have this need to uh, have meaning. So events happen sometimes, and what we do is we ascribe meaning to the events. And what we do is we connect the dots. Sometimes when we connect the dots and we ascribe meaning to a situation, the dots that we're connecting are not actually true. So for instance, one of the things you'll hear in church world, you'll hear something like this. They'll say, "Um, God sent this sickness to me because God wanted to teach me this. God sent this illness upon me because God wanted to do this through my life. And so God sent this sickness so that he could use this sickness in my life. The the problem with that is that God says, I am the Lord your healer. I am the Lord who heals all your diseases. By my stripes, you are healed. Jesus says, I come that you might have life and have it more abundantly. But Satan comes to kill, to rob, and to destroy. But sometimes as Christians, because we need to ascribe meaning to events, we say, God must have done this to me because of what he wanted to do. The truth is, nowhere in your Bible, especially as a New Testament believer, does God ever send sickness upon somebody to teach them something. It's just not the God of the Bible. Does sickness happen? Absolutely. We live in a fallen world. Bad things happen. 
but you never wanna say God sent this to me because God wanted to do something. When we do that, we're connecting the wrong dots and we're basically ascribing to God what God says is more likely the work of Satan. Does that make sense? So we do the same thing. Well, Leah's connecting the dots, but they're the wrong dots and she's coming to the wrong conclusion. Well, verse 19, Leah conceived and bore a sixth son to Jacob. Then Leah said, God has endowed me with good gifts now, uh, good gifts. Now you wanna underline, now my husband will dwell with me because I have borne him six sons. So she named him Zebulon, Zebulon. She says, I've given him six sons. Now he's going to love me. He's going to dwell with me. He's never loved her, um, but, but, but she says, now if I finally do this, he's going to love me. So she names him Zebulon. There in your outline just means dwelling or habitate, habitation. He's gonna wanna be with me now because I've given him six sons. Leah knew that she was unloved and she knew that Jacob did not want to be with her. But here's what she does. She spends her whole life trying to get his affection and she keeps thinking, if I just do this, then he will love me. It never works, it never works. You'll remember in the last chapter, Leah begins to have children. She knows that she's unloved, but in the last chapter, 29, 32, it says, Leah says, surely my husband will love me now. She thinks if I do this, he'll love me, but that never works. Well, it's just a few verses later, and Leah, she says, he gave birth to a son, and she said, now at last, my husband will become attached to me because I have borne him three sons. Well, it didn't work. He didn't become attached to her. It never works. So here in verse 20, Leah said, God has endowed me with a good, with, with a good gift. Now my husband will dwell with me because I have borne him six sons. So she named him Zebulon. It, it never works. Without going off on a tangent, if you're here today and you're in a relationship and you're thinking, if I just do this, surely they will love me. It does not work. It has never worked, and this whole chapter just continues to drive that point home. Well, verse 21, it says, afterwards she bore a daughter and named her Dinah. Now, Dinah, there in your outline, just means judge, judge. It's kind of like the female of, of Dan. We're not told of the daughters. Dinah is the only daughter that we're told about because the story is all about the sons who become the heads of the 12 tribes of Israel. But Jacob has a bunch of daughters with these women. We're just not told their names. So we'll see that later on. There in your outline, we get to Genesis 46 and also in chapter 37. But in Genesis 46, he, Jacob, took with him to Egypt his sons, his grandsons, and his, what's that word? Daughters and granddaughters. So he has daughters and he has granddaughters. We're just not told their names because the focus is in on the, the, the sons, the 12 tribes. Why are we told about Dinah? Well, we're told about Dinah because she's gonna be part of a very sad story when we get to chapter 34. And we'll talk about that then. Well, verse 22. Then God remembered Rachel and God gave heed to her and opened her womb. So she conceived and bore a son and said, God has taken away my reproach. She named him Joseph, saying, may the Lord give me another son. Or, may the Lord add to me, some of your Bibles might say, give me another son. Joseph, Yosef in the Hebrew, just means let him add there in your outline. Rachel does not seek the Lord. She does not give thanks to the Lord. She never does anytime we encounter her. What we're going to find in Rachel's life, and you wanna write this down, if I'm not satisfied with what I have, I won't be satisfied with what I get. And so we're gonna find she's not satisfied. So the first thing that she says is, give me another, let him add, just give me another one. She wasn't happy before she had Joseph. We're gonna find as the story goes, she won't be happy after she has Joseph. She's not, she doesn't give thanks to the Lord before Joseph, she doesn't do that after. So nothing really changes in her life. Well, I'm gonna stop right there at verse 24. Did you at least find that interesting today? 
So let me, let me say a couple of things before we, we just close. This is for, for the dads. Uh, and, and just think some things through. Just think some things through. Jacob, when you look at Jacob's life, Jacob is a believer. He believes in the God of the Bible, we would say. He's going to have a few very strong God moments along the way. But by and large, his family is going to be shaped by the culture. And he's going to allow some things in from his culture uh, that are going to wreak havoc in his family. And we'll continue seeing that as we go to the point where at the end of his life, he concludes, he says, as he looks back, he says, you know, my, my life was just, you know, the years were few and they were painful. He says they were few. The idea is it happened so fast. For those of you who are becoming empty nesters now or you are empty nesters, when you look back at your children and when they were small and now they're grown, we all say it happened so fast. It's what we say, isn't it? And, and it really does. Now, if you're here today and you have small children at home, you're wondering, when is it ever going to end? Well, <laughs> it happens fast. It happens fast. So he says it was few. And he says, and the other thing I noticed about my life is that it was painful. It was painful. He looks at his parenting. He looks at the, how he allowed culture to determine how he married. He allowed culture to determine how he had children. He, he allowed so much of the culture into his family to the point where none of his children will have the name of God, God of the Bible, in their names. And we're gonna see some things as we go why it was so painful for him. What we notice as we travel through this story at the critical moments in Jacob's life, it never says, Lord, how do you want me to handle this situation? Lord, how am I to go forward in this situation? He is tricked into marrying Leah. And he doesn't say, Lord, how do you want me to respond in this situation? He immediately goes to his father-in-law and says, you tricked me. It is interesting to me that the tribe of Judah and the tribe of Levi will come from Leah. I wonder, some would look on at this and they would say, well, you know, if he didn't marry all four girls, we wouldn't have the 12 tribes of Israel. Not so, not so. There are families in this church who've had more than 12 kids. God could have done it this way. Jacob allowed culture to shape his family. He never seeks the Lord and says, Lord, how do you want me to handle this? God still uses it, but it's a train wreck. It's a train wreck. I think for Jacob, he faced those difficult times and there were some hard decisions that needed to be made. He knew about his God, but he was so influenced by his culture that he went with the culture. Everybody's doing this. And ultimately it destroys his family. As dads, we have been entrusted with a family. And we are either going to be carried away by our culture or we're going to say, Lord, how do you want me to respond to this? I can't help but think if Jacob, on the front end, when he first got married, or maybe he made a mistake and took the second wife, or some, somewhere along the way, if he would have just said, I, I can't allow this culture to influence me anymore, if he could have seen what it was going to look like in just a couple of decades, if maybe, just maybe, he would have made some different decisions on the front end. Do you agree with that? I, I think he would. But here's the thing. Jacob didn't have a Bible. He, he didn't have what we have. You and I, we have the indwelling of the Holy Spirit. We have God's word. But if we're not careful in this time where the culture is just against everything God stands for, if we're not careful, we're gonna allow that culture to just come in and sweep our families away. And then if the Lord tarries, we look back and we say, it was so fast and it's painful. And I think it's painful because he didn't make the right decisions along the way. Dads, I want you to think about that this week. No guilt, 
No, just think about that. Make sure that it's your God who's determining how you parent, how you do marriage, as opposed to your culture, because the culture might be wrong. <laughs> I suggest that it is. That makes sense? Yeah. So with that, let's go ahead and, and close in prayer. Father, thank you so much for this congregation. Thank you for your word. Thank you for your spirit, the indwelling, empowering of your Holy Spirit. Father, we know where the culture is going, and so we just look to you, and Lord, at those pivotal times on a daily basis, we want to say, Lord, reveal yourself. Tell me to go this way or that way. Help us to discern between what's you and what's culture, what's right, what's wrong, what's truth, and what's error, and help us to lead our families, our families, to the place where they can grow and know that you are a, a true God, you're the living God, and you really do act on behalf of your children, your people. Lord, I pray that you keep each and every one of us until we meet again. It's in Jesus' name that we pray and all God's people said, amen. amen. God bless you guys. We love you. We'll see you next time.